before I go any further, let me just um, ask for a word of prayer. Um, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I am going to um, share some slides and my idea is to just give some historical background on the current conflict before touching on the, the war um, and then open for questions. So um, I'll, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen so that we can um, have a look at, together at some visuals. So uh, slides are visible to everyone? Yes? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so what I'd like to do tonight is to start by the way, if people give like a little electronic th thumbs up, that feels like a Baptist amen. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, right, so um, so I'd like to, to just give, um, to give you a sense tonight of five years that are important to understanding the background to the current conflict. Um, and then a little bit about the conflict itself. So the years that I'm going to talk about are 1991, 1994, 2004, 2013, that went, it was in the winter, so it went into 2014, and 2021, 2022, the present. Right, so when we're talking about a uh, background in Ukraine, um, 1991 is when Ukraine became an independent state. Until or before that time, immediately prior to that time, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, as I'm sure most of you know. And um, the Soviet Union is this big orange country here on this world map. So if we think of the world being 24 time zones around, the Soviet Union was 11 time zones wide. So it covered east to west, almost half of the map of the world. And Ukraine is on the far Western edge of the Soviet Union, right here where my cursor is. Um, and in, we can talk if, if we're gonna have time for question and answer at the end. So we, I'm happy to answer any questions about what sparked Ukraine's interest in independence from the Soviet Union. But what I wanna point your attention to uh, tonight, just for starters, is in December of 1991, Ukrainians held a referendum on whether or not to stay a part of the USSR. And Ukrainians voted for independence in a landslide with uh, independence won by more than 92% of the vote. And after Ukraine, Ukrainians endorsed the idea of independence from the Soviet Union, the leadership in Moscow, the Soviet leadership um, came to the conclusion that with, along with some independence movements in some of the other former Soviet republics, but especially because of the independence movement in Ukraine, um, there was a, a sense by the Kremlin, a sense by the leadership in Moscow that without Ukraine, the Soviet project did not make sense. So Ukrainians at the beginning of December, 1991, voted to, uh, to endorse independence from the Soviet Union. And three weeks later, um, Secretary General Gorbachev dissolved the, United, uh, the USSR um, as a political entity. So 1991 is when Ukraine traces its start as an independent state in the world. Second year I wanted to bring to your attention is 1994. When Ukraine, so Ukraine and this map of Europe is here, this yellow country here. And Russia is the green country on this side. Above it is Belarus. Here is Poland, Romania, Moldova, Hungary, Slovakia. So you can sort of see the context. Here's the Black Sea. Down here is Turkey. Over here is the Holy Land. Down here off the map, there's Italy. So it gives you a sense of where Ukraine is. The, um, the United Kingdom is over here. France is over here. So um, after independence in 1991, this is what the borders of Ukraine look like. And when Ukraine gained its independence in 1991, it inherited a large part of the arsenal of the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons. And uh, 
other, other parts of the Soviet Union also inherited Soviet nuclear weapons. Russia inherited Soviet nuclear weapons, Belarus, Kazakhstan, but Ukraine of the non-Russian states, Ukraine inherited the largest number after Russia. And Ukraine after Russia, Ukraine's were, were the number of nuclear weapons that could properly be called an arsenal. The majority of the Ukrainian nuclear weapons, the nu nuclear warheads, were missiles aimed at the United States. When I was working in the State Department, this was obviously a large concern for the United States. And we engaged in a dialogue with the government of Ukraine. And it turned out that this was a big question for the Ukrainians as well. Um, the Ukrainians were concerned about this nuclear arsenal. Um, and the reason that they were concerned um, had to do, there was three things they were concerned about. Um, number one and two kind of go together. They were worried about the threat of um, terrorist groups or of um, organized crime trying to take control of any of the nuclear material or any of the nuclear warheads. They, they were concerned about securing the nuclear weapons that were on their territory. The other, the third big concern that the Ukrainians had about having inherited these nuclear weapons is the Ukrainian government said, we have no imperial ambitions. Ukraine has never been an imperial power. We have, we have no intentions, we have no ambitions of trying to acquire territory. We have no in, intentions of changing our boundaries. We have no intentions of ever being um, an aggressor in a war. And so we don't see any need to have nuclear weapons. We don't see any need to, we don't anticipate ever needing to use nuclear weapons. We don't want them. And um, if we have nuclear weapons on our territory, we're afraid that that makes us a target for any other power in the world that might want to preemptively strike against our nuclear weapons. We are, we're afraid that having nuclear weapons makes us a target for nuclear powers. The only reason to have nuclear weapons is to have deterrence and we, so that another country will never see us as a threat. We're going to declare ourselves not a threat before the world. And the Ukrainian government made a historic and strategic government to give up its nuclear arsenal. It is the only country in the history of the world that properly can be said to have had a full nuclear arsenal that voluntarily gave up its nuclear arsenal. It declared nuclear disarmament. It signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which as you probably know, sets up a system of haves and have nots of nuclear powers in the world. It, it joined the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as a non-have, as a, as a have not state declaring that it would not have nuclear weapons. And as part of its decision to give up its nuclear weapons, it entered into a negotiation with three nuclear powers, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia, in order to um, negotiate a security guarantee. The Ukrainians said security guarantee from at least these three states, and those three states pledged never to use force to interfere with Ukraine's territorial integrity or political ind independence. That was memorialized, that agreement, that security guarantee was memorialized in a document called the Budapest Memor Memorandum that was signed in 1994 by those four governments, Ukraine, the UK, the US, and Russia. It was uh, that memorandum that you'll see Ukrainians are very focused on right now. What did that memorandum um, promise to them? And uh, what were they wise to have given up their weapons at that time? You can imagine that there are many people in Ukraine asking that question right now. Continuing on, we've talked about 1991 independence. We've talked about 1994 uh, disarmament. Um, third year that I wanted to bring to your attention is 2004. 2004 is the first year that we see 
obvious interest and intervention by the government of Russia into Ukraine's national politics. In 2004, Ukraine was having a presidential election. Um, again, this is 13 years after the Soviet Union had broken up. So for, through the 1990s, Russia, of course, had had relationship with Ukraine as independent states. They had a robust trade relationship. There are family relationships. There are business relationships. There's all kinds of relationships between the governments and the citizens. But it wasn't until 2004 that we see Ukraine becoming an, ob a, a, an object of Russia, of the government of Russia's overt attempts to interfere um, openly in national politics. 2004, Ukraine has a presidential election. The government of Russia um, that at that time was already headed by uh, Vladimir Putin um, chose a candidate that they wanted to win the election. They sponsored that candidate. President Putin came to Kiev. They held military parades together with that candidate. Um, they um, sponsored national advertising campaigns. They also threatened other candidates. They actually poisoned the leading opposition candidate. He didn't die from it. You may remember that incident. Um, they, an election took place, which most Ukrainians felt was rigged. There were uh, national reports of ballot boxes being stuffed or thrown out, elections monitors thrown out of windows, um, attempts to bribe citizens or threaten citizens into staying away or voting a certain way. Um, and so when the pro-Russian candidate was declared the winner of the election, Ukrainians protested, not all Ukrainians, but a large number of Ukrainians took to the streets of Kiev in a protest that became known as the Orange Revolution. And the Orange Revolution rejected government or uh, Russian electoral interference. The protests continued for six weeks. And the way that this political crisis of protest was resolved was that the political elites in Ukraine decided to rerun the election with international monitors to try to guarantee a free and fair election. They did run the election and the opposition candidate won. That protest movement was called the Orange Revolution. So 2004 was the first time that we see Ukraine um, becoming an object of overt Russian government attempts to interfere in national politics. And the citizens of Ukraine rejected that interference, held an election and elected the opposition candidate. Lest you think that the whole system was rigged against the, the Russians or against anyone who preferred a closer relationship with Russia, um, flash forward, the next presidential election in Ukraine was in 2010. And in 2010, that same Russia preferred candidate, whose name is Viktor Yanukovych, ran again and was elected. So he lost the free and fair elections in 2004, but he won the free and fair elections in 2010. And the pro-Russian candidate became president of Ukraine in 2010. Um, that man, Viktor Yanukovych, once he was elected, he sought closer relations with Russia but there's one thing that he did do. He continued uh, the, the policy that had been followed by all prior Ukrainian presidents of trying to pursue integration with the European Union. And that was economic integration. They were trying to draw closer so that they could trade. Because if you can see, and I'll go back one slide so you just get reminded, Ukraine is very close to all of these countries in Europe. Ukraine is an agricultural powerhouse. Ukraine is also a software development powerhouse. It's the Silicon Valley of the former Soviet Union. Um, Ukraine also has a big metallurgy industry. Ukrainians wanted to try to um, develop integration with Europe so that they would have a better shot at prosperity rather than having an unofficial iron curtain around this side of their border. They wanted to be able to trade on all sides with Russia and to the West, to the North and to the South. So to, in order to engage in trade with Europe, you, uh, Ukrainian uh, presidents since Ukrainian independence had sought economic integration with Russia. And when the pro-Russian candidate was elected in 2010, he continued that policy. 
of, of trying to integrate economically with Europe. Um, that candidate was, uh, again, President Viktor Yanukovych elected in 2010. I have this slide just to show, starting from 2006, uh, Yanukovych's campaign manager was a man named Paul Manafort. And if that name sounds familiar, he's a, he is a Republican political consultant from the United States. And he ended up becoming um, the campaign manager for a later for a US presidential candidate named Donald Trump. So 10 years before Trump ran for president, Paul Manafort was Yanukovych's campaign manager. There are uh, not a few people in Ukraine who assumed that Manafort was being paid both times um, by the government of Russia. So we have 2010, Yanukovych is elected president. Yanukovych continues to try to seek economic integration with Europe. And uh, the plan was for Ukraine to sign a to-do list, to negotiate with Europe a to-do list for what Ukraine needed to do to, to be eligible for the European Union. And they were going to sign this uh, agreement on the to-do list at the end of November in 2014, sorry, in 2013. The weekend before President Yanukovych was supposed to fly to the Baltics to sign that agreement with Europe, he was summoned to Moscow. And uh, after spending the weekend in Moscow, he came back to Kyiv and held a press conference and announced that he was reversing course. He was gonna do a U-turn on European integration. And this aroused protest in Kyiv. At first, the protests were small. They were less than a thousand. Um, so it's 2013. Yanukovych is supposed to sign an agreement with the European Union. He goes to Moscow, comes back from Moscow and announces a complete reversal, a complete U-turn on the policy of European integration. A few people came out to protest, uh, less than a thousand, until the Ukrainian police, having received a call from Yanukovych, the Ukrainian police uh, cracked down on the protesters, and it was the first time that, um, in a mass way, um, the police had used violence against protesters in independent Ukraine. There were a lot of people who didn't care about economic policy. There were a lot of people who might have been pro-Russian, may not have been pro-European, but there were a lot of people who said, aside from the policy that people were protesting, we don't want violence used against demonstrators in our country. And so the day after the violent crackdown on the demonstrations, it went from 1,000 protesters to more than 500,000 protesters in the street over one night. Um, in fact, there are estimates that there were a million protesters. So this protest movement occupied the center of Kiev called the Maidan, and they referred to themselves as the Euro Maidan, meaning the pro-Europe Maidan. And uh, these Occupy protesters continued to occupy central Kiev uh, through December, through January, into the beginning of February of 2014, the protests grew and grew. The motivations for the Euromaidan protesters. So now we're on to our 2013. We're talking about, we talked about 1991, we talked about 1994, we talked about 2004, and now we're talking about 2013, 2014. That's the, that's the fourth year that I want to talk about. Um, there were three motivations for the Euromaidan protesters. First motivation was to return on a course towards integration with the European Union. Second motivation was to oppose police brutality towards those exercising freedom of speech and assembly. The third motivation was to stop corruption associated with the Yanukovych administration and regime. By the middle of February of 2014, the protests had been going on for three months and Yanukovych made a decision to use lethal force to disperse the demonstrators. 
the government forces started uh, to fire, to use live fire against the, the protesters um, in this between, it started on February 19th. Between February 19th and February 21st, um, more than 100 of the demonstrators were killed uh, by bullets. Um, so they were, they were shot to death. And they still didn't give up the central square. The rest of the protest movement didn't. Um, this move to disperse the protesters backfired on Yanukovych. Uh, members of his own party, between February 19th and February 21st, members of his own party uh, were so repulsed by his having taken used lethal force against the demonstrators that they stood up in front of TV cameras and disavowed uh, their party membership. They said, as long as Yanukovych is head of the party, don't consider me a member. Within the span of three days, Yanukovych had lost his parliamentary majority and uh, he had a political crisis. Um, February 19th was when the crackdown started. By February 22nd, he had such a political crisis on his hand that on February 22nd, he signed an agreement to, uh, with the opposition for, to share power. And then a surprising twist, uh, in the middle of the night, after having signed the agreement, President Yanukovych fled the country in the middle of the night. He abdicated the presidency and he fled across the border to Russia, which is where he has remained to, until now, or at least until very recently. Um, this photograph shows the, the night before he fled, it was they signed the power sharing agreement in the afternoon to calm the political crisis. They held a mass funeral on the Maidan for the protesters that had been uh, shot by their own government. Um, in the middle of the night, Yanukovych fled the country. Um, I can tell you, I'm sitting in St. Louis, Missouri. If any of you remember the Ferguson protests from 2014, it was the same year. 2014, it was just a few months later. Here in the St. Louis area, a young man named Michael Brown was shot by the police. And I was thinking back to six months earlier in Ukraine, when we were protesting the shooting of Michael Brown here in St. Louis, I thought in Ukraine, when a government kills its own citizens, the president has to flee the country. And in the United States, when a government kills its own citizens, I don't see big change. I was actually jealous of the activism and the efficacy of uh, the demonstrations in Ukraine at that point. So we had this Euromaidan movement that had protested against Yanukovych and his policies for three months. Yanukovych flees the country in the middle of the night on February 22nd. Um, he and his uh, advisors, uh, including his cabinet, including his campaign manager, they all disappear from Ukraine. Citizens are walking through his uh, estate the next day, seeing his fleet of Bentleys and seeing other signs that people interpret as signs of corruption. And Ukrainian citizens exhaled. They thought, okay, we've had a political crisis. We've had three months of protests, giant demonstrations of a million people in the streets. Um, now we can exhale, now we can breathe and we'll have a chance to relax and rebuild. And that feeling of exhaling lasted for about five days because five days later, if we're looking at this, this is a map of Ukraine, down here is a peninsula called Crimea. Five days after Yanukovych fled the country, some strange guys wearing uniforms with no insignia invaded Crimea. They didn't have their names. They didn't have their rank. They didn't have the flag of the country that they represented. They were all fully armed wearing bulletproof vests and helmets, as you can see, um, automatic weapons, but uh, with no sense of where they came from. And the residents of Crimea woke up to see these guys everywhere. There were 17,000 um, Ukrainian government installations on the peninsula of Crimea, on, on the, uh, the part of Ukraine that is, is Crimea. And every single one of them was surrounded by these guys. 
Um, the locals referred to them as little green men because it was like they had come from Mars. <laughs> It's like little green men had de descended from UFOs because they wouldn't say where they were from and they purported to be from nowhere, but uh, Crimea was invaded. As it turned out, they were um, soldiers from Russia and within two weeks, um, the government of Russia had organized a referendum at the point of a gun on Crimea, on the status of Crimea. And then on March 18th, the Russian parliament um, passed legislation annexing Crimea into uh, Russia. And so Crimea was annexed uh, by the end of March. So if there had been a political crisis that had lasted until the middle of February, and then Yanukovych fled to Russia, within two weeks, Crimea had been annexed by Russia. Um, the you, there was no president, there was no minister of defense, there was no cabinet in Kiev. They had to, to hold presidential elections to replace the guy who fled across the border. There was a complete power vacuum up in Kiev. And so it was clear that the orders from Kiev down to the Ukrainian army down in Crimea were, was don't start a war, don't shoot first. If they try to provoke you, don't accept the provocation because if they have a have any excuse, it's going to be a bloodbath. And the last thing we need is a bloodbath. And so Crimea was taken almost without a shot. There was a few deaths, but almost without any deaths. And the Ukrainians thought, okay, if we'll have a tactical retreat, we will cede Crimea for now, not forever, but for now, to try to give ourselves time to hold a presidential election and regroup. Two weeks after that, the little green men showed up in southeastern Ukraine and an invasion of southeastern Ukraine began. When we talk about the war in Ukraine now, we say that the war has been going on since February 24th of this year. But if you ask Ukrainians, they will say the war has been going on since 2014. It's been going on for eight years. They have had an armed conflict and this line here is the, has been the front from 2014 until now. That war that ran between, or that started in 2014 until this year, before the current war even started, there were 14,000 people killed in those eight years. That produced, that earlier conflict had already produced 3 million internally displaced people. And, the, um, and it had a huge effect on the economy. There had been uh, questions about whether the war in southeastern Ukraine was going to split the country. And it's a, it's a kind of um, cliche to say that Ukraine is split east and west. And I'm, if you follow my arrow on the map right here, you can see that there's a river that goes through the middle of Ukraine. If we're thinking about a comparison with the United States, we think of this as like the equivalent of the Mississippi River of Ukraine, dividing the country into East and West. And there were, there were predictions, and you will still hear this cliche that there's the pro-Russian East and there's the pro-European West in Ukraine. What has happened since the war started in 2014 was an unexpected consolidation. Crimea is down here. The war had started in southeastern Ukraine. Kiev, the capital, is up here. Um, after five years of war, it turns out the population became united. In 2019, there was a presidential election. The guy whose name I'm sure you've heard by now, Volodymyr Zelensky, was elected president in 2019. He ran on a platform of trying to uh, stop, trying to reach an agreement to end the war with Russia in southeastern Ukraine. And this shows you in 2014, this was how the political party voting looked in Ukraine. So you can see why people would talk about the East and the West. It's not perfectly East and West, but there was a division. The West tended to be, vote as a bloc and the East and the South tended to vote as a bloc. Look, compare that 2014 map to 2019. The country has become much more united and it's only the smallest fringe closest to the areas that are occupied by Russia in the Southeast. 
It's only those areas that were voting for the so-called pro-Russian parties. The rest of the country voted for Zelensky and his party. And Zelensky was not perceived as being pro-Western or pro-Russian. In fact, Zelensky had, was born in Ukraine, but had spent most of his adult life in Moscow until Crimea was annexed in 2014, he moved back to Ukraine. But he had lived in Moscow most of his adult life. Um, by birth and by family, by birth he's Jewish and by family origin he's a speaker of, his first language is Russian and not Ukrainian. He was born in a town called Krivirik, which is about right there in South Central Ukraine. So we have Zelensky, uh, uh, we have the war apparently having unified the country and Zelensky elected in 2019. The last time that I was in Ukraine before COVID was the summer of 2019, and this is what our prospects looked like. Um, these are friends. I've known that guy since he was six years old. He's now 32. He has four kids. Um, they were having more babies. People were feeling optimistic. Um, this is one of the students who started the first Euromaidan protest in 2014. Uh, she was a college student. And she was, uh, at that time in 2019, I think she was 24 and she was an advisor to the parliament. They wanted somebody who knew the protest movement to help them write legislation. So there was a real sense of optimism. Um, and that's how things looked in 2019, the last time that I was there before COVID. Um, the points that I'd like you to remember about this background. First of all, I want you to remember the Budapest Memorandum um, in which uh, Ukraine negotiated to give up its nuclear uh, arsenal. It engaged in nuclear disarmament together with uh, having negotiated a security guarantee from the US, the UK, and Russia. Second thing that I want you to remember is a distinction between NATO and the European Union. There is sometimes a tendency to call all European institutions by the same name. NATO is a defensive alliance. The European Union is an economic alliance. Ukraine has consistently sought membership in the European Union. Ukraine has some, some presidents have sought membership in NATO, some presidents have not, but NATO has not invited Ukraine to be a member. So I want you to keep those two things separate. Economic integration is the thing that Ukraine has consistently pursued with Europe. Military alliance is not something that has been consistently pursued, although Ukrainians are more interested now than they were three months ago. Um, finally, when President Putin uh, launched the attack on Ukraine on February 24th of this year, he said that he was going into Ukraine to denazify and to demilitarize. I just wanted to point out the absurdity of denazifying a country led by an elected Jewish president whose grandparents, three of his grandparents died in the Holocaust. His fourth grandfather fought against the Nazis all the way to Berlin. And demilitarizing the only country in the world to have given up a nuclear arsenal. That's an absurdity and a kind of on the in the case of Putin calling the Ukrainians Nazis, it's not only only an absurdity, it's repugnant. Um, so on the eve of the current conflict, uh, as of January 26, this uh, I was asked to give a talk on that day, and this is how I was evaluating the relative. I didn't do this graph, but this is a graph that shows the relative strength before the war started. Uh, in terms of numbers of men in the army or numbers of people in the army, uh, the Russian army is uh, something like double, more than double the Ukrainian army. And then if you look at air power, there's no comparison. It was 67 fighter planes to 1,500 something fighter planes. If you look at attack helicopters, it was 34 to 500 something. If you look at tanks, it was 2,400 to 13,000, or yeah, 2,400 to 13,000. Armored vehicles, 11,000 to 27,000. Artillery, 2,000 to 4,000. Um, 
warships 13 to 234. There is no comparison between the, the Ukrainian firepower and the Russian firepower. In terms of that conventional military strength, the advantage was clearly to Russia. In terms of uh, nuclear weapons, obviously the advantage was clearly to Russia. Um, and people had asked me the, to assess this, uh, the comparative combat advantage at the end of January before the war had started, because as you remember, Russia had started massing troops all around the edge of Ukraine. And when I was comparing that combat advantage, I said self-defense motivation advantage Ukraine. Little did I know how right that part was gonna be. <laughs> I am astonished if you had asked me how long would it take uh, the forces of Russia to capture the, the capital, Kyiv, if they wanted to, I thought I wouldn't have expected a day. I would have thought half a day For, to get from, I'm going to just go to a slide where you can see, um, look here at Kyiv. The Russian forces were massed here in Belarus, and they were massed all around the, ex the, the border of Ukraine. So they were massed around on, on these sides, and they also had troops over here on this border. So there were Russian troops on three sides of Ukraine. And to get from Kyiv to the northern border, I have driven that in a 1988 station wagon that was not a very good station wagon, and I drove it in two and a half hours. I thought, a good Russian military like personnel carrier could probably make that drive in three hours. I wouldn't have expected Kiev to have lasted half a day. I'm astonished. Um, this map is from February 28th. Surprisingly, the areas that uh, where there are Russian troops and the cities that are held by Ukraine versus Russia have practically not changed in that time. The city of Mariupol has been under shelling, under bombardment uh, for three and a half weeks. The city of Kharkiv has been under bombardment for three and a half weeks. Astonishingly, they have not surrendered unless it's happened in the last couple of hours um, uh, while I was preparing to talk to you guys. So I there may be questions. The only other thing that I wanted to point out is that in addition to this kind of stalemate, we have seen a uh, an enormous number of refugees fleeing Ukraine. This map was from uh, the first 15 days of the war. Now we're about day 26. We have something like three and a half million refugees that have fled Ukraine. The previous world record for refugees was 1.2 million people in an entire year. We have now had 3.5 million refugees in four weeks. We have tripled the world record for production of refu refugees in a month as opposed to a year. And the last really astonishing thing that I wanted to bring to your attention was this graph, which comes from a sociological survey of Ukrainians um, three weeks into the war or two weeks into the war. Um, so Kiev is under bombardment. The second largest city, Kharkiv, is under bombardment. The South is under bombardment. Ukraine is surrounded on three sides. The question up here is that was asked of uh, 1,200 Ukrainians, so of sample population. Um, do you consider the future of your country? Sorry, this is moving to me. Do you consider the country, the, the future of your country to be hopeful or not hopeful? Hope wins. The green part shows the people that said hopeful we're 91%, which is just astonishing. So it may look dark or bleak. War is dark and bleak. It's a tragic and desperate situation, but we should not be less hopeful than the people who are under bombs themselves. Um, this is some ideas about what we can do uh, what people can do if you're interested. Um, and I can copy some of this text and put it in the chat. If you, So I'm gonna copy this and um, put, um, what I would uh, ask you to do as follow-up activities is to follow what's going on as best you can, to pray and to advocate for refugees. There are 3 million refugees and there's gonna be double that before we're done with this at least. 
Europe cannot absorb them all. They're going to be coming to Latin America. They're going to be coming to the United States and Canada. Um, there's going to be a lot of refugees, and it's going to put a lot of stress on refugee support for people from other locations that are, have already tried to flee as refugees from other places. So pray and advocate for refugees. I also ask you to pray and advocate against the militarization of economies, against the militarization of thought, including our own thought, and to pray and advocate for disarmament. I am very concerned about the fate of Ukraine, not only for my love for you, my own Ukrainian friends, um, but also because Ukraine took the brave step of giving up its nuclear weapons. Any other nuclear armed country in, in the world has got to be looking at Ukraine right now and thinking, how is this going to come out for Ukraine? As goes Ukraine right now, so goes the hope for nuclear disarmament in many places. I ask that you pray and that you advocate for disarmament. If you are moved to donate, there is an organization called Razum for Ukraine. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, they have a list of um, places where you can donate to help, for example, Ukrainian hospitals or direct relief agencies, uh, service providers that are on the ground in Ukraine right now. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides real quick so I can put some things in the chat and then move to questions. So here's the, the first thing that I've done is put in the chat some sources of information. If you're looking online, there's a, a newspaper in English called the Key of Independent. There are also Twitter accounts from news and from scholars. Um, and then let me put in the, um, the web address for that organization, which is called Razum for Ukraine. Razum just means together in Ukrainian. So Razum for Ukraine um, is going to go here. So for anyone who's interested in any ideas about uh, if you're interested or feel moved to donate or to otherwise contribute, they have an entire list that's very well developed. I'm gonna stop there and just take questions um, because I'm really interested in what people um, might have to ask. And maybe 